Spinsky. We'll be interviewing Stephen Pinker today. Well, Stephen, thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you here at ISIR. And I must say that uh, I, I really feel like I'm at an incredible advantage because uh, we are going to get a candidate this afternoon because Stephen's mother is in the front row <laughs> and I have never in my life had a fact checker of this quality. <laughs> so, Ron, thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you and um, I'm going to just dive into your Sunday. <laughs> okay. uh, Steve, before we get into the substance of your contribution, we, we kind of like to get of uh, your academic career and what you feel is important to know about your development up to your PhD. What were some of the key things that happened to you to get you to that point? I think I was always interested in human nature and what makes us tick. And uh, in, uh, as a uh, student in college, at Dawson College here in Montreal, courses in a number of disciplines that had something to do with uh, the human mind. Anthropology and sociology and philosophy. And psychology seemed to sit at the center. Um, it seemed to be the hub from which all of the spokes emanated. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, uh, it's the human mind that makes many questions in biology interesting. Uh, why are we more interested in the brain than in other organs like the kidney? There's a decade of the brain that hasn't you can do without kidneys, but brains are kind of interesting because right. they give rise to minds. Right. And uh, some of the most interesting questions in evolution are how did something like human intelligence uh, evolve? Uh, in genetics, one of the fascinating questions is how do you get a um, trillion synapse human brain out of a 20,000 gene genome? In the other direction, a lot of the subject matter of the social sciences and the humanities are, in a sense, applications of psychology. The arts are products of the human mind. Uh, the literature and fiction and poetry are uses of human language. The visual arts uh, very much depend on how our visual system works and music hinges on our uh, auditory perception. So, uh, and uh, social and political questions are questions social contracts, uh, how we uh, enjoy the advantages of living in social groups without being exploited. So psychology seemed to me to be the, the, uh, the discipline that uh, really got to the core of uh, human nature and all of its manifestations. And I liked psychology because it, it dealt with uh, timeless questions of human nature. Are we basically cooperative? none of these questions is a binary yes or no. But it, it addressed these profound questions with methods that seem to be tractable, namely experiments. It was, it was the sweet spot for me. Okay. And then you developed expertise in cognitive psychology. You made so many diverse contributions. How did someone with your background, someone who at one point in his career, and uh, I'm not putting him on the spot because Stephen has said this publicly, said early on he found individual differences uninteresting. How did someone at that stage of development become so interested in human psychological diversity that you developed expertise Well, it's true that at the end of the language instinct, uh, my first popular book, uh, I commented on how one topic that I did not cover in that book and that I had never studied myself up to that point was uh, how we differ, just because the individual differences within the normal range just seemed like you know, a little ripple of noise on top of something interesting that we all had in common. 
So it's a very different question of what makes a brain smart? How do we solve problems? How do we invent things? How do we discover things? What makes some of us a little better than others on a quantitative scale struck me as just less interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, um, but I, I would not have, have uh, as you pointed out, I would not write that today. Uh, I do uh, individual differences are interesting in a Ways. One of them is if you're interested in human nature, what what is innate across the human species? What, what makes a human a human? Uh, one of the ways to study it is to to look at uh, how something varies, since you need some kind of independent variable in science to study anything. So if you're interested in what do the genes install in human nature, it's a diff you could compare humans to chimpanzees. There there are a number of ways of getting at it. But one of them has to be, well, let's look at differences in the genes and see how they correlate with differences in psychological abilities. Uh, another was the, the fact that um, something that I didn't appreciate until reading an article by uh, uh, Tom Bouchard and, and uh, his colleagues in the late 80s in uh, science that pointed out a, a problem that I uh, got a deepening appreciation of, which is that behavioral genetics isn't just the study of genetic influences, but it can lead to surprising discoveries about environmental influences, right. namely the um, small contribution of the so-called shared environment, mm -hmm. which comes as a, I think came as a surprise to everyone. And it was pointed out by, um, by Robert Coleman and Sandra Scar, David Rowe, and later Judith Harris, the, one of the profound discoveries of behavioral genetics is not so much that genes matter, though that still comes as a shock to many people, mm -hmm. but that the part that isn't genetic isn't necessarily familial, isn't necessarily parental. Mm -hmm. That there's some profound source of variation in what makes us what we are that is neither genes nor uh, families. Right. That's a, that's a discovery that I find even uh, uh, almost 15 years after publishing it's very hard to get people to even understand it, mm -hmm. let alone try to explain it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a profound intellectual puzzle about what makes us what we are. Uh, I have my own uh, favorite hypothesis about it, as best my, my own interpretation of the evidence, that a lot of it seems it's probably no developmental noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so non shared environment as the name of the variable that accounts for that chunk of variance may be somewhat misleading. Uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, it's a bit of a digression, but I, as an answer to your question, it is a highly interesting question of uh, what is it other than our genes that make us what we are, and that's something that can only come to light through behavioral genetics, uh, study of intelligence and personality. And then, of course, there's the evolutionary question. Uh, given that uh, my uh, interest in evolution was uh, as answering the why question about how the mind works, not just how does the mind work, but why does the mind work the way it does as opposed to all the other ways you could imagine it might have worked? The ultimate answer to that lies in large part in uh, evolution. What, did, what were the selective forces that gave rise to the human brain? And of course, individual genetic variation is the raw material of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, that itself is hugely, I can find hugely interesting, but it does, does lead to questions as why is there a residual variation? Why aren't we all why did natural selection just select for the fittest phenotype, making us all pretty much indistinguishable except for maybe some uh, normal distribution of noise? Now, maybe there is nothing to normal distribution of noise. These are questions that uh, a number of people have raised of uh, what, what is the best explanation for the variation that we have now? Is it, uh, does it come from selection in different, uh, of different populations, different environments that then merged? Mixing together adaptations to heterogeneous environments? Is there frequency dependent selection so that some traits are useful until they become too common? Uh, is it uh, that, uh, I think, unlikely that successful societies need mixtures of expertise and so there's selection at the level of the group? I doubt it, but it's a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. That itself is another set of interesting hypotheses, hypotheses above and beyond. Uh, do we vary, and uh, how many dimensions are there? Right, right. Now, you, you said so many interesting things in, in the blank slate. One, one that jumped out at me and is 
so relevant to the people uh, attending this conference is the way you sort of chuckled in your book about <coughs> academics denying the existence of intelligence. And you said they're actually obsessed with intelligence. And they're only um, all, all, all too um, willing to describe different colleagues in terms of intelligence, <laughs> contrast themselves with others in terms of what, what is going on here? What, what would academic gossip be without <laughs> discussions of ridiculous comparisons of intelligence? Yeah, I, oh, we've got to hire her. She's really, really smart. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. what's, what's going on? And has, has your, have you been able to refine this in any way in the last 15 years? I think the, uh, yeah, I think the reason that uh, people talk about intelligence is that it should not be any surprise to this group, namely it exists, it varies, and it's important. So you just can't live your life, uh, your day-to-day -day life, your, your hiring, your promotions, your dealings with students, uh, on the assumption that we're all indistinguishable. I mean, I just you need to be out of touch with reality. On the other hand, uh, individual differences, innate individual differences, is an issue that has become politicized mm -hmm. for the reason that I mentioned in, reasons that I mentioned in the blank slate. Namely, that people conflate <coughs> the issue of uh, ought we to be fair to everyone, not prejudge anyone, with the question of are we indistinguishable? The uh, contrast between uh, fairness and sameness. Mm -hmm. But um, because of some sensitivity, understandable, that uh, individual differences could be used to fortify a class system, to make invidious uh, justifications for uh, racism or ethnic prejudice, uh, that as a result, the very idea that people could differ innately became moralized and politicized. And then that fed back on the empirical issue, uh, at least when people were in intellectualizing mode. That is, when they were making explicit statements about intelligence, they were on their guard to the political and moral implications, at least what they thought of as the political and moral But then when intelligence wasn't discussed as a topic, but you were actually dealing with people, you couldn't avoid it just because people do get into intelligence. Right, right. So there is that, that kind of systematic hypocrisy. Yeah, hmm. interesting. And as there is in, in a number of other topics. Well, sure. Okay, uh, that, for which you are surrounded by hypocrisy. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, in preparing for this interview, I, it occurred to me that you have probably read more of the articles uh, by ISIR members than 99% of uh, academic psychologists. And I was just wondering your take on, is there, is there anything you think the field of intelligence should devote more attention to or is being conspicuously neglected? Well, I think it would be, um, I, I, I'm not an expert in the history of, uh, I don't know how you want to characterize the field, whether it's individual differences, psychometrics, behavioral genetics, right. testing, um, that cluster fields historically seem to have developed in, uh, separately from mainstream experimental cognitive psychology and right. cognitive neuroscience. Right. Uh, there have been, uh, attempts to, to unify them. I remember uh, Buzz Hunt right. uh, back in the 1970s who mm -hmm. made a stab, and uh, James Lee, who's here, and his thesis tried to uh, answer the, the, uh, the question that I think is a profound question of uh, how is this variable that we call intelligence, and a variable is indirectly connected to reality. It's just something that, uh, that varies. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mathematical construct. Mm -hmm. It pertains to something real. I don't, you know, obviously, I don't agree with the critics that say that it's just a, a fiction of the uh, methods of factor analysis. Right. Uh, there is something real there, but what is that real thing in terms of both how it uh, causally allows some minds to solve problems and others fail? That is, what is the actual effect on millisecond by millisecond cognitive processes? And uh, James is. Uh, uh, argued with, with uh, some beautiful data that uh, models of uh, millisecond by millisecond decision time that use the, the metaphor of diffusion of 
accumulation of evidence in a kind of random walk uh, where the uh, available information builds up an internal noisy signal as to whether you believe one thing or another, decide one thing or another, uh, that the rate of diffusion is what we mean by intelligence, or what we're measuring when we measure differences in intelligence. But anyway, that's the attempt to bridge the gap between a dimension of how Lisa differs from Sally, how John differs from Bill, with how does the mind of John, Bill, Lisa, and Sally do anything intelligent? That, right. is, I think, is a central in, uh, scientific challenge. In the other direction, the bridge to evolutionary uh, biology is important. What, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you might expect that natural selection would uh, converge on the optimal design, except for maybe <coughs> random mutations that pop up that take time to eliminate. Mm -hmm. Is that the architecture of genetic variation? How do we reconcile these two bodies of uh, knowledge, namely behavioral genetics <coughs> and evolutionary psychology and biology? Again, a topic that, that uh, James has made an uh, important contribution to. And then in the third direction, uh, how does this relate to differences in the structure of the adult brain? And even more interestingly, the development of the brain in utero in the first years of life. So what does uh, this elixir that we call general intelligence, uh, which again is a mathematical construct, mm -hmm. it points to something real, what is that real thing? Mm -hmm. and, and where would you like to see the field be in about 20 years? So I think uh, and, uh, new ideas for each of those three questions. Uh -huh. um, also the um, going beyond um, general intelligence, which is obviously such an, uh, a powerful uh, vector that it just it not only soaks up a lot of the variance, but it soaks up a lot of the intellectual energy in the field. Right. Mm -hmm. But clearly, people differ from each other uh, in ways other than just how smart they are. Right. And uh, I would like to, um, especially now that new methods are available for polygenic scores that can look at variation with a suitable, suitably large sample size mm -hmm. that may have been kind of submerged in the noise uh, in the smaller samples right. of course methods. How can we get a handle on a person who's just verbally really fluent and maybe not such a, not so spatially uh, acute or vice versa? Right. In fact, I'll just to go back to your very first question. The, the reason that the the trajectory that led me to an interest in, in individual differences came in, in part, and my interest in psychology, came in part from my former colleague at MIT, Noam Chomsky, mm -hmm. who uh, I became aware of through an article in the New York Times Magazine in 1972, when I was just a college uh, freshman, on the Chomsky and revolution in linguistics. That was one of the things that got me interested in language and in cognitive science more generally. Um, I, was, I never studied with Chomsky, and I was not a colleague of his in the same department, because he's a linguist and a psychologist. Right. But the question of, is there a, uh, uh, an innate faculty of language that accounts for why children universally uh, learn to speak so quickly uh, through casual exposure across all societies in a way that seems independent of the technological sophistication of society, to some extent um, can dissociate from general intelligence. What's going on there in terms of its genetic architecture? Mm -hmm. There was hope for, uh, I think, naive hope 25 years ago to find you know, various language, uh, language gene. Uh, we know that that is extraordinarily unlikely. Right. But we now, there, there could be you know, 100 or 200 or 300 genes that uh, collectively give us the power of language, mm -hmm. uh, neither, none of which are indispensable, each one of which makes some contribution because and that question can be asked of other dimensions of both personality and uh, intelligence so it'd be nice to see methods develop that could find the source of that variation both in the genome and in sets of behavioral tests I guess I'll uh, uh, another couple of seconds keep going um, it, it is re remarkable that uh, such robust uh, effects in studying intelligence in general can come from 
tests that are so theoretical. Mm -hmm. That is, they're just a bunch of things that some people are better at than others. But they, the items are rarely selected as kind of probes for particular cognitive components. Mm -hmm. Now, it, I think it's a remarkable discovery that despite that, these tests pick up effects that are so robust. Right. But it'd be nice to get to bridge the gap and, and, and develop methods that maybe are more acute at finding dimensions of individual variation mm -hmm. that may account for less variance than, than G, but that are probably there, that require more subtlety and sophistication to pick up, both phenotypically <coughs> and genetically. Mm -hmm. But I suspect they're there, and it'd be nice to see the field uh, you know, turn in that direction. Now, I, I take it as kind of a consensus in the field that despite denials outside the field, there are some effects that are so robust that it's getting a little boring to say them over and over again. Right. And such as that intelligence exists and it's mm. highly heritable and you know, all of the familiar uh, uh, accomplishments. And so what are, the, uh, what are the next steps? How do we go a level deeper and ask questions at the next level of subtlety now that that's at least established? Right. Now, you're, you're especially unique in your work because you have uh, combined your scientific work with writing for the popular press. And you, I, I know it's not effortless, but it appears effortless. And how, how, how has your experience with the, plastic, with, with the popular press informed you in terms of maximizing the impact of your scientific work. How do you put these two aspects of your career together? Well, in, in part, I'm uh, fortunate in that regard in that the, the main content area in psychology that I study is language. Right. And so the question of how to use language to convey complex concepts, uh, can there's a certain synergy with uh, the scientific curiosity of in how language works in general. So I'm kind of fortunate in what I study is also what I use. Right. And they have gone, and I uh, recently brought the two of them together when I tried my hand at writing a style manual, my most recent book called The Sense of Style. Right. Uh, the, uh, my subtitle was The Thinking Person's Guide to Writing in the 21st Century, where the thinking person's guide was meant you know, not just as a little bit of advertising, uh, an advertising gimmick, but because I, what I hoped would, was the comparative advantage to that style manual among the competition is that I tried to get at the reasons why certain bits of style advice work and, other, and others are superstitions that should be avoided in terms of how the human mind processes language. So it was a, a psychologically oriented style manual. Uh, but uh, I find that there are two ways in which writing for a, a broad audience I, I think um, feeds back and improves my basic research. One of them should be familiar to any of you who, have, who, who teach, which is I assume almost all of you. Namely, often when you explain your subject matter to uh, intelligent but uh, temporarily ignorant undergraduates, mm -hmm. where the best philosophy of teaching is often to assume that your students are smart and curious, but they're just some things they don't know. That your job is to teach them those things. That's similar to the mindset of writing a book for a general audience. And one of the first rules in, in uh, uh, writing that academics are not really aware of is that writing for general audience does not mean dumbing down or mm -hmm. talking down. It means uh, that it's most effective when you assume that your reader is as uh, is your equal, uh, but they just haven't seen something that you've seen. And your job is to point it out to them. Right. Now, so all of you who have taught undergraduates uh, know that sometimes you don't understand your own subject until you try to teach it. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has had the experience of being up at the, there used to be these things called blackboards. Mm -hmm. Some of the older people might remember mm -hmm. that. But, uh, you're out there, and you're kind of talking your way through a uh, lesson you'll feel, and kind of realize, oh my god, what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. And I never realized it before. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to kind of bullshit my way through the fact that I don't really understand what I'm saying. 
Uh, or do I confess, you know, I'm just going to say something that doesn't make any sense, and I better go back and learn it better myself. Mm -hmm. So that kind of experience that many of us have through teaching, I also have very often in writing. And it's only when you try to explain something from first principles to someone who you assume is uh, highly intelligent, and you sometimes realize that your own understanding, maybe your own personal understanding, maybe there's a gap in the field that your field has never addressed the question. So it helps me in that way get back to basic questions about my own understanding and about the field's understanding. The other thing, ironically, is that, that I learned um, is that uh, the degree of fact-checking in academia is, is quite pitiful. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, Anywhere from you know one to four referees who are <coughs> not paid, anonymous, have access to mind, uh, have a limited amount of time to spend, and they uh, spend a lot of their energy on um, you know is this finding you know, true, make me happy or not? Uh, when you write when something that gets read <coughs> by tens or hundreds of thousands of people, many of them eager to that the, the Big Shot Harvard professor is wrong yeah. about something. Yeah. You get a degree of fact checking that is just unprecedented for right. an academic. And so I have learned, since, since being called various errors being pointed out, mm -hmm. things that I should have looked up the first time, but I just trusted my own memory, which we all know you should never trust. So I become a much more assiduous fact checker. Uh, I don't have to write it for the public. Who let all kinds of things slide that they don't go look up. Yeah. You know, it, things like, you know, as Mark Twain said, you yeah. know, maybe you should look up to see if Mark Twain <laughs> really did say that. <laughs> yeah. And, and he almost certainly didn't. You know, since you brought up your book, I have to ask you this, um, because I suspect um, some of the people in the audience suffer from this. You you talk about the curse of knowledge and how that what is that? Curse of knowledge, it's a term that uh, came from economics, but it refers to a phenomenon that many of us in psychology know by other names, uh, such as egocentrism, <coughs> such as uh, uh, lack of theory of mind. Mm -hmm. But it's most generally the difficulty that we all have in knowing what other people know. And in particular, the, the curse of knowledge refers to the fact that when you know something, it's very difficult to imagine what it's like not to know it. Very hard to sub subtract an idea from your own knowledge base and uh, anticipate what the mindset is of a person who doesn't know that particular fact. Mm -hmm. And I think that the big, biggest source of <coughs> unclarity in writing and communication is the curse of knowledge. The fact that when you write, it's hard to appreciate that what's obvious to you may not be obvious to everyone else. Right. So people skip steps in arguments, they describe things generically where the reader needs concrete detail, uh, talk about the stimulus, or the variable, or the paradigm, or the context. All of these concepts about concepts that uh, are actually kind of meaningless unless you know specifically what's being referred to. Uh, and uh, forcing yourself as much as you can, which is not very far, to at least try to anticipate something that and doesn't know. And since we aren't very still to show a copy to other people and take seriously what they're not understanding or what they're missing. Because we're, we're not so good at uh, putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. Now, some of us, because we deal with <clears throat> sensitive topics, and um, when I consulted colleagues about what would be some ideal questions to ask Steven Pinker that would be relevant to the society and to academia in general? The, the dominant response was, what do we do about the climate on a major universe? Tolerant of controversial views and debates and problems of uh, Summers and the pushback. Um, it, it seems like um, the very concept of uh, a universe.
university was designed to foster this kind of debate. But what is going on? What, what can yeah. we do about it? Uh, it's an excellent question. I, I wish I knew the answer, but here's some, uh, some ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems is that universities are uh, <coughs> taken over by uh, a, a strange, unelected cadre of bureaucrats who are not in the chain of command from the uh, their kind of professors to two deans to presidents, but um, the the Bureaucracy, the diversity bureaucracy, the sexual harassment bureaucracy, the, um, uh, the various other federal mandates that have to be implemented. And they kind of travel horizontally from university to university. They have their own conferences, their own professional societies. Um, and they uh, have a, uh, I think we're all too ready to outsource the running of the university to these bureaucrats. And they have their own as to what a university education should be, namely to uh, protect students' feelings, to advance uh, uh, equality, fight racism. And they're not, uh, <coughs> they haven't thought through issues like constitutional guarantees, principles of free speech. Uh, they've got a limited mandate, and um, they've got an awful lot of power that, we, that somehow, without anyone noticing, we in the universities have ceded to them, combined with the, the, the lawyers. Uh, Harvey Silverblade, the Silver Li civil liberties lawyer in uh, uh, Massachusetts, says that basically the most important person in the university now is the, uh, is the, the, the chief counsel, the, uh, that a lot of the decisions are made and people don't realize it by the, the, the top lawyer. Interesting. And the university presidents do what the lawyers say you got to do. So that's an institutional uh, factor. There's also, we don't really know, I haven't seen data, but I'd like to see it on how, what percentage of the students actually uh, are intolerant? Uh, is it a case of pluralistic ignorance where everyone assumes that everyone else uh, wants to shut down controversial speakers, but the vast majority of people don't want to, but it's the activists who create the trouble, mm -hmm. uh, and since everyone assumes that everyone else is an activist, we don't realize how small of a sector of the undergraduate population that is. Kind of like what's been claimed for uh, binge drinking on campus. Mm -hmm. No one, actually, very few people actually think that binge drinking is a, a good idea. But if you poll students, all the other students say, well, I think it's really disgusting and stupid to you know, party till you puke. But you know, what can I do? All the other students think that it's really cool. And you poll all the students, and each one thinks that all the other students think that, and no one really thinks that. So I suspect that some of that is going on in terms of this enforcement of an orthodoxy that it may not be anywhere close to a, a majority or consensus view, but there may be a core of activists who realize that they can uh, make their lives meaningful, exert power, flex their muscles, and no one's going to push back. So that's, a, that's a second uh, uh, factor. Um, the third is that um, great danger uh, that, that I, we should be sensitive to and avoid is not to allow free speech to become a right-wing issue. Issues do get branded as left-wing and right-wing. Mm -hmm. It's not intellectually necessary that they be branded the way they are. So just as an example, environmental protection has become associated with the political left. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest predictor of, say, belief in anthropogenic climate change is not science degree correlated. The people who believe that science and the people <coughs> who deny it. But what predicts it perfectly is politics. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny man-made climate change. Same thing with evolution. People who believe in evolution are not scientifically more sophisticated than the people who deny it. Uh, but what predicts it is basically, are you religious or secular? So issues, con contentful scientific issues can take on a political coloring through, I think, partly historical reasons. Oh, sorry, just to complete the theory of your thought. Environmentalism used to be a right-wing issue. It used to be seen that way. Uh -huh. It was uh, kind of a landed gentry <coughs> protecting the views from their estates and uh, preserving habitats for duck hunting instead of worrying about important issues like the war in Vietnam and racism and poverty. It was kind of considered to be a frivolous luxury to worry about the environment. 
then that flipped. So anyway, the politics and the business <coughs> can join in various combinations, and I think we're seeing a danger of free speech becoming associated with the, with the right, and that, is, that would be terrible. So one of the ways to fight back is to remind everyone, students, peers, university bureaucrats especially, that uh, free speech is, and, and freedom of inquiry, is not just a, um, it's not a feel-good slogan, it shouldn't be a, a shibboleth of something that we say is good and other people don't care so much about, but it really is prerequisite to doing anything else, simply because you're not infallible, you're not omniscient, I'm not either, so no one should have uh, the mandate to use brute force to shut someone else down on the assumption that they are 100% deserve that they're correct, mm -hmm. because history shows that people who were sure that they were correct <laughs> were not. Right. And in fact, in the past, the recognition of human fallibility and limitations of knowledge was essential for a number of progressive causes that we now are grateful for, such as opposition to segregation, and before that, slavery, and, um, and women's rights, and gay rights. If we didn't have freedom of speech 30 or 40 years ago, and those movements could not have gone off or gotten off the ground. Right? It's, it's essential to remind people of why free speech is fundamental, not just we insist that it's a good thing, but here's why it's a good thing. And, also, and thereby also to tap some of the sentiments, especially among students and younger people, that when they, if the moral imperative is uh, combating racism, combating sexism, to point out, well, yeah, but we couldn't have done that without free speech of the past. Right. And a lot of people's feelings were hurt in the past. A lot of people felt pain to have their ideas of male superiority and white superiority challenged, and too bad for them. It's a good thing that they were hurt and they felt unsafe. But since back then, as now, no one knows, no one can say that they're omniscient and infallible. That's why we always need It, you, you know, I, <clears throat> I have to smile because one of the things that people admire about you is the extent to which you'll change your mind as the data come in and um, they shape your views. And I, I've been told that all of your life, strong opinions. <laughs> uh, you didn't time that question so it occurred just as <laughs> <laughs> What made you think of that? <laughs> My uh, sister, who was honored by the Society three years ago with the Constance Holden Award, right. who's a, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, an author of uh, Sexual Paradox and the Visual Effect, and my mother, uh, Rosalind Pinker, in the audience. So, uh, uh, but, yeah, but yes, I, uh, I, I grew up with a combination of uh, immediate uh, and uh, frequent interactions with uh, at least two uh, brilliant and, and uh, forceful women. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we did, because I, thanks to data and behavioral genetics, I'm intermittently skeptical of the impact of family influence. <laughs> this is a, uh, a lesson that I, that I learned from uh, Judith Rich Harris, who argued that a lot of environmental effects that we tend to attribute to parents are probably better attributed to the uh, peer culture. But I, uh, uh, of course, her arguments pertain to the kinds of things that we can measure psychometrically. I don't know if attitudes towards women fall into that, uh, that, that category, and it may be that there is uh, more influence in the family for, for something like that. But uh, I also grew up in the, uh, my formative years were the years that um, the second wave of feminism became, started to become mainstream. And it was, uh, so it, even as a teenager, Era in which, so I was born. I'm a, I was born in 1954. The probably the cresting of second wave feminism kind of 
began, I would say, around 1970, um, even though there were obviously precursors, Simone de Beauvoir, mm -hmm. and that way, Japan in the 50s and 60s, but it really kind of hit the national stage starting in the 70s. <coughs> and at the time, I mean, those of us who lived through it remember that uh, women's rights were considered a, a kind of a joke, a, a laughing stock. It was you know, women's livers and the hairy armpits and burning their bras. It was kind of a source of comedy. I do remember at the age of 15, kind of in a late night bowl session with a friend of mine, just you know, listening to music. And it's, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. It's kind of reasonable. It's like, yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. <laughs> so uh, I feel part of like the, I think the first, not everyone in my generation went through that epiphany, but I kind of grew up with the idea starting as a teenager, uh, that uh, equality of sexes was just um, you know, part of the air we breathed. It was uh, a change in the culture that I was kind of, that grew as I grew up. And that, I think, combined with my family experience uh, kind of led me to, I mean, I, I, I call myself a, a feminist. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that men and women are not, um, are, are distinguishable, they're not indistinguishable. And my argument has always been that has nothing to do with uh, feminism as a political and uh, uh, moral mission. Mm -hmm. I'll mention one other anecdote which would be consistent with the idea that my, my family upbringing uh, I did, I remember having, having a conversation with a, um, a magazine editor. He said, did, did you have a sister? Did you grow up with a sister? I said, yeah, I have a sister and a brother. He said, oh, I thought so. I said, well, well why? He said, well, you speak to, to women as if they're human beings. <laughs> Which, uh, I was, uh, what year was this? This was uh, in the 90s. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, which, by the way, also shows that uh, despite the fact that I said that I kind of grew up in an era in which women's rights were right. ascending, clearly the fact that she felt that, that called, called attention to it. Absolutely. We have a long way to go then, and we have a long way to go now. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I, for all the progress, which I, I you know, the other side of me, together with <clears throat> arguing for the existence of a human nature that doesn't change quickly, but I, another side of me plots um, human dimensions of human progress. Uh, in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, mm -hmm. I uh, <clears throat> uh, documented that uh, any quantifiable measure of violence has gone down over the course of history. February, I uh, brought a number of other dimensions of human progress. Education, um, of course, the, the, the Flynn effect being in a, uh, another dimension of human flourishing that's increased. But uh, poverty, literacy, uh, happiness, um, opportunities for of experience. But one of them is that um, uh, sexist attitudes uh, have definitely gone down. Uh, but they're still nowhere near zero. As right woman in this audience will, uh, will attest, and as the, the magazine editor reminded me, but the, the, uh, the progress is unmistakable. And even though it's, it's kind of funny, it almost sounds reactionary to say that we've made progress. It seems that progressives are the people who are most militant about the fact that progress doesn't exist. But, uh, but I, I'm someone who believes both in, in human nature and in the, the reality of progress. And you can, you can apply it in, in just about any measure of attitudes towards women uh, there has been. Uh, you just can see the curve going down of sexist attitudes. I'm still very far above uh, zero, but yeah. much better than I used to be. Right. Stephen, who were your scientific role models? Um, I've had influences. I don't know about role models. I mean, almost every, anyone who's influenced me, I've departed from in various ways. Sure. sure. Uh, but I've had uh, a, n a number of teachers. Uh, undergraduate, um, Al Bregman here at McGill University, uh, was uh, my uh, undergraduate advisor. <coughs> and he's a, a <coughs> brilliant researcher in auditory perception, uh, and I, I did work in his lab on how the brain um, organizes the auditory input to distinguish the different voices of musical instruments or background sounds. But in, Al was interested in uh, cognition more, general, more generally, uh, cognitive psychology. Um, I was fortunate, again, since we're speaking here at, at uh, McGill, uh, although uh, D.O. Hepp, the great right. 
theoretical neuroscientist, <coughs> psychologist. He was emeritus when I was an undergraduate. Okay. But, but he was still around when I heard him speak a couple of times. Um, I <coughs> never heard Wilder Penfield speak, but, um, but I did hear Brenda Milner, maybe in this very room. Uh, and uh, so those were, and John, the late John McNamara was uh, one of my teachers at McGill, uh, Tom Schultz. And in graduate school, Steve Costland was my PhD advisor, a pioneer in the study of mental imagery. Uh, my uh, postdoc advisor was Joan Bresman, a linguist who had trained with Joan Chomsky, who had developed her own uh, rival theory of grammar that I was kind of trained in. Mm -hmm. So those are my, my immediate mentors. Among the people who have influenced me in various intellectual ways, they're some of the founders of cognitive science, George Miller, um, Marvin Minsky, mm -hmm. Herb Simon, Alan Newell, uh, Noam Chomsky, Jerry Fodor, uh, the philosopher Hilary Putnam. Uh, in uh, evolutionary psychology, um, my friends John Tooby and Lita Cosmides, mm -hmm. but also Donald Simons and uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, and then the people who inspired them, Robert Trivers, uh, Richard Dawkins, George Williams. Uh, in individual differences, um, the uh, uh, Judith Harris in her, her book, The Nurture Assumption, mm -hmm. but, uh, and uh, uh, Bob Plowman, Tom Bouchard, right. Matt McGue, mm -hmm. the classic, uh, I'm not sure called classic, but it's still around. Yeah. Um, uh, but then, uh, in almost any area, one of the reasons that I have, I think, um, explored different areas that I feel after a while that I've kind of devoured the really interesting, original, profound, unusual ideas in a field, and then I get, I don't get exactly bored, but I get curious yeah. about wanting to take ideas from other fields. Right. And so I switch, um, and I'm voracious for ideas that seem to have powerful ramifications. Professional regrets? Um, well, do I have any professional regrets that I want to share with uh, several people? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pretty out. You know, I, I, I should probably say no simply because I'm very aware of how uh, fortunate I am, how, how, how lucky I am. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, in one of the unusual situation of having a tenured professorship at an American. I mean, early 21st century privilege, uh, which is a, a privilege, one that I don't take for granted, mm -hmm. and um, especially in this economy, to have almost lifetime job security, and benefits, and salary, and you know, summers to do what I want, and intellectual freedom, which is still, despite the threats, yeah. still extraordinary at American and Canadian universities. Right. For all the threats, right. uh, you, know, you, you can still explore conflict. So to go back and say, you know, who knows what I would have done differently that could have made, a lot of things could have been worse in my, in my life. And so I'm, I'm being grateful for the things that, uh, that went well. And that's yeah. why I find it hard to answer that question. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, this might be a, a, a little embarrassing, but you don't, you don't have to be right about it in terms of syntax. But what are you proudest of when you look at your professional production? Uh, probably the better angles of our nature. Uh, I wouldn't have said that even, that, I, that came out in 2011. Right. And even until recently, I probably would not have said that. I probably would have said How the Mind Works, the okay. book where I tried to integrate um, all of psychology and evolution and genetics and, uh, and anthropology. But the better angles of our nature has seems to have had an, uh, uh, a rippling effect that I not anticipate, and I think leads to, or at least mm -hmm. it leads to, but uh, encourages or makes plausible a progressive vision of uh, the human condition. That is, it holds out the hope that uh, for all of the troubles that face us, for all the challenges, for all the reasons that we could be fatalistic or pessimistic, the historical data show that we can make things better. And, uh, in 
have in the past. Uh, this is not a <coughs> utopian hope. This is not a, a, a sunny aspiration. This is cold, hard data. And it suggests that we could achieve more in the future. Mm -hmm. This is what a number of people seem to have taken from it. Uh, it's what I think it's the theme that I have uh, tried to extend in the next book. And so that seems to be larger than any of my other projects. See, all I didn't anticipate it at the time. Right. The, the data are fascinating that, that you present. I, I have heard critics not denying the argument you made that affecting the data, but <coughs> expressing concern about what some people might take from that, given that modern technology, one person can do so much damage now. And worry about that? Um, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It is a question that I take up actually in the forthcoming book. Okay. It is raised, uh, namely, as technology uh, empowers people, right. does it follow that <clears throat> more and more can be done with fewer and fewer people mm -hmm. until you fall into its logical conclusion and one person can end the world. Yes. Uh, a Bulgarian teenager can brew the genocidal virus in his garage yes. or develop a nuclear weapon in his uh, bedroom. Yep. Uh, so you know, we don't know. But yeah. I, I, I'm, there's reason to be skeptical. So uh, Kevin Kelly, the technology expert and the founding editor of Wired magazine, has argued against this just general line of, of uh, argument in terms of how technology works. It says, as technology advances, it actually becomes socially more distributed. Uh, that is, anything that is worthwhile is not accomplished by uh, a lone genius. Mm -hmm. the, the James Bond villain in his lair, uh, concocting a scheme to take over the world, and all the technology works uh, by magic without a, a huge support staff. That's just not the way technology develops. Uh, that anything you have to do, you rely on a huge network of other people. That network is bound to extend to all of the people who have a stake in keeping society uh, going and intact. And as your conspiracy uh, broadens, there are more opportunities for stings mm -hmm. and for defectors and for blunders, uh, which is why uh, in his perspective is he was you know, on the ground floor of the uh, uh, personal computer revolution, the internet revolution mm -hmm. back in the 80s. And everyone was saying back then, any day now, technology will outrun our capacity to control it. And then and there'll be a disaster, the internet will, will fail, and pandemics will be uh, released. He said that, that, that doesn't, hasn't happened, and it doesn't seem to, seem to be any closer to happening. And it's because of the, this other narrative progress of technology that it becomes socially distributed. As we have a responsible society where there are a lot of people who have an interest in keeping the internet up or keeping the <coughs> epidemics from spreading, then there's only so much damage that the sole uh, James Bond villain could do. Stephen, when you look back at your career with 2020 hindsight, would you, would you have any advice for the younger Stephen Pinker, the assistant professor starting out? Uh, and I can think of a lot of anxieties that I had then that I could say, you know, things will turn out okay. Yeah. Although I didn't believe myself at uh -huh. the time. But again, I, uh, I think it was kind of, be kind of churlish or ungrateful to, right. uh, to try to, I mean, I can think of things that I, I would have done differently, but you know, on the whole, uh, I'm, I'm so lucky that I can't really uh, wisely regret anything and how, how my life has turned out, at least so far. Okay. Before we, we open this up to the audience, I have, I have one question that I, I know uh, many people in the audience will, will value your response to, and that is we have a lot of young academics in the audience and postdocs and assistant profs. And because this is an intelligence conference, I'll focus it on intelligence, but you can you know, generalize freely to young academics. to 
he um, great heated intellectual curiosity about the subject matter that spans academic disciplines. That uh, there are academic disciplines and sub-disciplines and sub-sub-disciplines. Then there are interesting questions, like what is intelligence? And there are academic disciplines that kind of get associated with intellectual questions. But generally, the questions overflow and crisscross the academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I think there are always opportunities to draw connections in this particular context, say, between uh, psychometrics and cognitive science or artificial intelligence or evolutionary biology or molecular genetics or neuroscience. Right. Uh, so that would be uh, the one to be alert for opportunities to explore questions with the tools of Uh, another is, at least in this context, it's uh, everyone is aware of the fact that this is a, has become a highly politicized topic, and to be uh, neither oblivious nor uh, kind of cringingly apologetic to the political issues, to be aware of them, uh, to uh, not let the political issues uh, deter one from, from honest research but not to be oblivious to the fact that uh, people will draw conclusions and to be aware of, of what they are, to anticipate them, to, uh, to try to make arguments that as to why the, the research is intellectually and practically valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you just can't do research in this field without being aware of them. Right. Uh, and that doesn't mean uh, uh, starting off from Talking about intelligence, no, no, I'm really not a Nazi. Uh, that, that's kind of not a good strategy. <laughs> but um, just to make the most honest argument, just to uh, taking into account the the uh, risks and benefits for why this is a, an important intellectual question. Sure. Well, Stephen, this has been a delight, and uh, I think what I would like to do, because I know people have questions to just open this up to the audience. And I will call on people uh, because I know there are going to be a number of hands up. And um, uh, we will field a few questions now. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start out with uh, James Flynn. And James. There's a button on on your, everyone has a button, well, so we can pick this up because we're taping. Right. As always, when I encounter uh, oh, yeah. buttons, right. so. Press the button, Bob. Right here, I thought. Okay, I get it. I'll keep it. All right. As always, when I encounter Steven Pinker's book, there's so many ideas. Does he want to comment on a lot of things? But one I wanted to pick up on having to do with the lack of intelligent debate on university campuses. And a lot of this, of course, is repression. But you mentioned one who are intolerant of speech they disagree with. You point out that women's studies would never existed if there had been a similar intolerance of, you know, unpopular ideas 40 years ago. And I find that to talk to students about what happened 40 years ago, you might as well be describing the evolution of microbes on Venus. <laughs> that, that is, it's uh, an ahistorical generation. And much of the poverty of debate on campus is that by now, most academics are ahistorical and semi-illiterate. And they're turning out students that are ahistorical and semi-illiterate. And this means that informed debate on a whole range of issues is virtually impossible, not because of speech codes, but just because of the poverty of intellect at universities. And as you know, I have a bit of a crusade on that subject. But uh, it's one that's often neglected. You know, much of the poverty of debate in university is just that staff are narrowly vocational, they have no awareness of history or of world literature, and they turn out students who are just the same, 
And any argument that goes back more than 10 years uh, is just not a, a, an argument that gets any resonance. Yeah. Well, I, I'm always I, I'm sympathetic to what is often deficient about uh, university education, including the historical shallowness. And it's not just university education. I think it's intellectual life more generally, uh, in, such as the op-eds that you read in, in the, you know, the, the New York Times or the Guardian or, or any of our popular uh, magazines. And I, I've become sensitive to this uh, having plotted rates of violence over time, that, uh, and most of which have gone down you know, with, with a lot of wiggles and occasional spikes. But it is remarkable to uh, read even our most esteemed op-ed columnists talked about how uh, the world today has you know, never seen as much war, uh, and which is just dead wrong. It just We forgot about all those other wars that are over that killed far more people, like you know the Iran-Iraq war, which killed half a million people uh, in the 1980s. The Vietnam War killed 10 times as many people as the wars in Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan combined. So there's a lot of historical amnesia, which I think is regrettable, combined with a kind of enumeracy where uh, we know as psychologists that people are influenced by available examples, Tversky and Kahneman's availability heuristic. If something pops into uh, mind, uh, you assume that it's frequent. You read about a shark attack, you assume that lots of people get eaten by sharks. Uh, you don't read about car accidents or falling off ladders, you don't realize how many people die falling off ladders. I've always, though, for that very reason, I always uh, hesitate before talking about the current generation because I'm a baby boomer and we weren't so historically deep either. Uh, the, uh, and our generation was pretty intolerant of uh, certainly the protests against you know, Richard Herrnstein and E.O. Wilson. Uh, those took place in the 70s, they, you know, decades before the millennials were born. So it's it's a perennial problem. I don't. Maybe it's worse. I'm not convinced that it's necessarily worse, but it is a problem. And I agree that historical depth and statistical depth should be much more of a, uh, an essential part of undergraduate education and and of not and of intellectual discourse more generally. And so your various defenses of liberal and humane ideals, um, understanding current events in historical context. I, I, I'll, I'll I think we need much more of that. Toby? Yeah. Um, uh, when I interviewed you for The Spectator about a year ago, um, you said that your next book was going to be a kind of defense of Western values and Western civilization. Not Western, enlightenment. Enlightenment, okay. West has um, always been squirrely about the enlightenment. Okay, <laughs> enlightenment values. Um, uh, You've been very successful in your career to date in avoiding um, uh, antagonizing um, the campus thought police and avoiding meeting the fate of the Richard Herndsteins and E.O. Wilsons. But if you do write a book, I mean, if this forthcoming book uh, makes a, a positive case for, okay, not Western values, but Enlightenment values, that seems to be something that's pretty controversial as we've heard the climate on current university campuses in America is more intolerant than it was. Do you think actually uh, your luck might run out with this new book? <laughs> uh, I, I, do, I choose my, uh, I manage my controversy portfolio carefully. Uh, I've, I've staked out a number of controversial positions and that have had uh, pushback. But I remember a bit of advice from my <coughs> late philosopher Robert Nozick, uh, who was at Harvard, died in the, uh, uh, about 15 years ago. He said, you don't have to have an opinion on everything. And so there are certain topics where I just haven't expressed a, a public opinion on. Uh, no one would, would say that I'm not an opinionated person. But, um, but I think it's important not to uh, kind of fly off So I don't know. It, it's possible. It's it's what I'm hoping is um, that uh, since even though many people in fact are opposed to enlightenment values, by enlightenment values I provisionally define them for the sake of the book as. 
as reason, science, humanism, and progress. But particularly reason, science, and humanism, the Enlightenment idea being that leads to progress, those three. Uh, in fact, those are much more controversial than people admit in practice. There are a whole lot of people, not that many, saying I'm against the Enlightenment. I mean, the Enlightenment. A lot are, but it's not a, it hasn't become a, a hot button by its name. So I'm hoping there'll be some degree of stealth that people will uh, like the uh, character of the Molière play who's delighted to discover he's been speaking prose all his life. Um, I'm hoping that people will realize that they've been humanists all their lives without necessarily uh, assuming the label. But we'll see. Maybe my luck will run. Rich? I'd like to ask you about the blank slate. Uh, with respect to your comment about the ripples, the positive ripples caused by better angels of our nature, did the blank slate have similar ripples? Because I would have hoped it had big ripples. Did it or, or did it not? I think it, had, I think it had some. I think that, um, I like to think that it had some. It was just republished last year in a, um, a new edition with an afterword where I try to um, update the conclusions um, from the book, including many of them coming out of research from people in this room. Uh, uh, in one sense, the fact that we have this new wave of intolerance would say you know, nothing has changed. Uh, on the other hand, if, as I suspect, the intolerance comes from to the very idea of native individual differences, innate sex differences, that there was in the 80s and 90s, maybe if we had some inroads. And there have been some surveys of the, uh, um, the uh, uh, presence of blank slate beliefs in, say, surveys of textbooks and so on, which suggests that there, it still very much is a, uh, uh, a widespread dogma, but that there has been movement. And I, I think you see this in mainstream uh, discussions, say, just in picking up the, uh, um, the, the Globe Mail or the uh, Guardian or the New York Times, um, but some issues that just would have been radioactive in the 1970s, uh, such as evolutionary explanations for, for uh, uh, behavior or uh, sex differences. Uh, now I think they sometimes, depending on the context, they can be discussed not as controversial topics where the news is those ideas, but the ideas themselves are uh, part of a larger discussion and can be used to make an argument without themselves being uh, identified as uh, raging controversies. So some, not, not enough. Yeah, we haven't quite seen that in intelligence yet, but we're all hoping for it. Well, I don't, know, be I don't know if anyone in this room or who contributes to this literature has kind of done a survey of textbooks or popular press treatments of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we, have we, have we just had a presentation <laughs> on it. Well, I'd, like, I'd like to get a copy of that. So my, my sense is just looking at, I teach introductory psychology and I have for 20 years. The textbook that I use, admittedly not randomly selected, mm -hmm. but has a very, uh, scientifically accurate treatment of intelligence and heritability of and heritability of intelligence, personality, and psychopathology. Uh, I doubt you would have seen in the when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I but I, I don't know what the overall trends are. Don't don't get that. I'll email to you. Send me, please, yeah. Linda? Uh, yes. Maybe only you can uh, have the evidence on this, but my sense is that uh, when someone eminent uh, and uh, writes a book that's well reasoned, they provide cover for other people in a sense. They say, wow, someone said that, <laughs> right? Um, and it gives them confidence. Uh, they can always turn to you and say, well, he said it, <laughs> right? Um, but you might know or you might have been told by people, thank you.
or that sort of thing. Because sometimes people who speak out and get away with it um, uh, provide great comfort <laughs> uh, and encouragement to other people who who wouldn't who think they couldn't have done that, but they are encouraged in their own lives now and their own jobs to do more of that. You get any of that? Uh, A lot of it. it it's uh, it, it's pleasing to me to think of that. Yes, so I, I hope so. Do people say that though? Um, sometimes, yeah. 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 There's a vast that, yeah, right. underground silent majority is my sense, and you only hear about it when someone kind of sticks their neck out and people say, wow, great. <laughs> in, a, yeah. in a way, I, you know, I, I, I know that I've taken on these controversial topics and have gotten, they're, they're, I don't even understand why, just taking the, um, this particular controversies that, that, uh, that everyone in this room is, some people seem to uh, completely float about controversy, even though they they have made claims that are uh, you know, within, within the, the mainstream of, uh, of uh, cons scientific consensus, but controversial outside the field. So the in theory, for example, um, uh, not pulled any punches, has uh, made it claim, uh, his claims pretty clearly. Uh, without, without apologizing, and I don't think he has, at least he told me several years ago that he's never been a uh, 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 focus of controversy. Um, I have been, not as much as some people like you know, Charles Murray or, 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 or you, um, partly because there are certain topics that I, that I don't take positions on. I haven't written on, on uh, race and intelligence, uh, you know, knowing that that is a, uh, you know, a third rail. So it involves some sensitivity also as to what is controversial and what is radioactive. Um, so <laughs> and what you can contribute to best, presumably. And what you can contribute to best. I think it would include topics that you w could contribute to most. Yes, where, where, where to I'm not going to write a book on linguistics. You know. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> hi, I was going to try and ask a Pinker family question, because when a family is introduced with achievements, someone like me thinks, well, uh, genetics, it's a family. And it's interesting, because you'd said uh, earlier in your talk, um, we have to look at this issue of the non-shared variance. I mean, is it noise, or is it that people are creating their own niches, and these are the unique ones, and they're not unique ones, well, they're just another version of genetics. We may be underestimating the real genetic effect. So I'd like your answer on it, and I'm quite happy if you're interrupted by two other people as you give the answer, but when you think of your, fa you know, your history, do you think of it in the way that David's asking, you know, then I made this decision, then I made that decision, things had an impact on me? in the way that I and others would often think, if I hadn't gone to that school, if I'd had this particular brain, you know, that was the reason. That's the reason why I incidentally haven't written a best-selling book in psychology, it's the school, all right? So are we going to be, first of all, do we need to rethink the way we're doing our analysis of variants to include self-created niches? And then also, are we going to start Reevaluating the way we talk about our family histories and life, and we'll start saying, I came from such and such a family, my ancestors were these, that's why I'm literary, that's why I do things, as opposed to, hey, I worked, I followed the advice of my tutors, and things develop from there. I think those are all profound questions. So, I mean, in my case, again, I teach a lot of us, is, particularly ill equipped to explain what made us what we are. Because I don't know what would happen if I had had an identical twin. With Deep Nevada. storage. Yeah. <laughs> you need 100 for all the things. Exactly. <laughs> not, one wouldn't be enough. Uh, also, uh, it, the conclusions, the so-called you know, free laws of behavioral genetics, pertain largely to the things that are easily, that, we, that are measured. Uh, there are many things that, that 
aren't connected, that are not personality um, dimensions or, or intelligence dimensions, but that are part of what make us what we are. So I mentioned, for example, that I uh, read an article in the New York Times magazine about Noam Chomsky when I was a college freshman. Well, my parents subscribed to the New York Times magazine. And if it weren't, weren't for that, maybe I would not have uh, read that article. And I grew up in a book, in a, in a house with uh, encyclopedias and books and arguments over the dinner table. And, uh, uh, that may not have, may or may not have affected my uh, level of intelligence or my big five personality scores, but it may have influenced my curiosity about human nature as opposed to you know, geology or, or classics. Uh, it's very, very hard to reconstruct. So I suspect that that has the conclusions about the limits of familial influence, uh, which do pertain to personality and intelligence, may not pertain to other particulars of a, of a life, which clearly are influenced by, by family. Uh, Questions like, uh, I, I, I guess this would be part of my answer to your question of what would be, where where should the field, where would I hope the field would go? The questions like, so it would be this big, I, you know, I call it the Mr. Jones factor from Bob Dylan, something is happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? The, the, the so-called uh, unexplained variance, the non-shared environment. Uh, you know, what do we mean when we talk about that? Uh, we can't be. We often talk about niche construction or uh, geoscientific interactions, but to the extent that that is itself, as you point out, partly a function of our genetic makeup, that variance we just get kind of sucked up in the uh, genetic contribution anyway. So even if it's the pathway involves a back and forth with the environment, it doesn't account for this unexplained connection of individual variation. Now, when, when I, you know, I say, well, I think a lot of that is due to chance. Well, what does chance actually mean? It's not, you know, not the mechanics of you know, irreducible probability, but chance often means lots and lots of little causal influences that we can't identify. So things like, well, if I hadn't picked up the magazine that happened to be on the coffee table that day, my life could have gone in a different direction. There's a sense in which that's chance from the bird's eye view, but there's a sense in which it's completely de deterministic from what happened in my brain at that moment. Yeah. Uh, there, there are, I think there are a lot of questions like that. There are chance events in, of course, as we know, and this is a big theme of the afterward to the blank slate, that uh, there's a sense in which the effects of genetics can be underestimated if by classic twin and adoption studies, if we don't take into account uh, both uh, new mutations that are introduced to generation and somatic mutations in the development of the brain in uh, the first few years of life. So it could be that they are identical twins, are not genetically identical, in which case some of the since the, it's the differences between identical twins reared together that give us that non-shared variance term. So maybe it's not that as genetic yeah. if identical twins aren't genetically distributed. Uh, and others might be dubiously environmental if they have to do with, even quite apart from genetic differences, if with identical genomes, uh, some axons zig in one twin and zag in another, it may be biologically determined at the microscopic level, random at the macroscopic level, not really environmental by any conventional definition of the environment other than uh, ungenetic. These are all, I think, fascinating questions. None of them easy to study. I mean, none of, them, none of which we can answer just with classic methods, twins and adoptees, but I, but I think just scientifically. In the back, you. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Ah, hello. We've heard the good news, as Linda would call it. So the progressive take on these trends, these, these the declining, the, sorry, the better angels of our nature, the declining intra and intergroup violence. And you say you're, you're producing another book where you're looking, or looking at extending the nomological net of these trends. Well, to that I would say, what about the bad news? Because co coexisting in time with these trends are other trends, such as now several 
phenotypic and now even genotypic indicators that G may be in decline. Uh, measures of social alienation, declining population in the industrialized regions of the world, um, these sort of things, possible mutation load increases, etc. Could it be that some of these indicators of decline are masked, essentially, by these indicators of progress? Or could it even be, and I'm going to say something controversial, and most people who know me know I'm not controversial at all. Um, could it be that some of these decline, these declension indicators might actually be byproducts or a function of this progress of which you speak? Uh, for a number of things. Um, so what the, the way I think of it is not so much uh, whether there are positive developments that mask negative developments, but the progress is always the balance between positive and negative developments. That Solutions to problems always create new problems. Uh, and there's a constant uh, process of solving the new problems that arise as solutions to old problems. So whether they're, uh, you know, I, um, in terms of the uh, incre phenotypic increase in intelligence, the, the, the uh, gun effect, uh, and it had to be obvious that, I think it's called um, Stein's Law, things that don't Things that can't go on forever don't. Uh, so the effect is obviously subject to Stein's law with Davies' corollary, which is things that can't go on forever can go on longer than you think they can. <laughs> so the, and I, I, uh, I myself don't have a sense as to whether any kind of you know, dysgenic effects are uh, how likely they, how strong they are, how likely they are to persist, whether. Uh, if there is a problem of declining birth rates in industrial populations, that itself may not be a problem that, that can be solved by changing incentives for having children. Uh, we know from comparisons across European countries that European, Western European countries with uh, similar levels of affluence and um, education can have different birth rates, in part because of inscrutable cultural differences part because of different incentives as to how much of a pain in the neck is it to have a baby, how, how accessible is health care, how much of a hit do you take care. By you, I mean typically more often women than men. Uh, so it's possible to change policies in a way that might uh, push back against some of the problems that come from a declining uh, birth rate. Uh, in terms of mutational load, do we, uh, it's very hard to know how that weighs against the advances in, um, in medical care, uh, including in the future, uh, including perhaps, who knows, uh, ways of uh, making up for mutational load by um, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis so that if you are carrying a mutation, you don't choose the zygote that has the double dose of that uh, recessive gene. Something that I'm actually aware of myself since I and my wife are both uh, carriers of a gene for familial dysautonomia. Um, we met too late to have children, but if we did, with today's technology, we could be guaranteed of not having a child with familial dysautonomia, something that would not have been true uh, 20 years ago. So uh, I guess my general answer is, it would be magic if every trend was positive. I mean, that just can't happen, and God doesn't smile on us. But the question is, are we, will we continue to be clever enough that the negative trends can be uh, counteracted by even stronger positive developments? Well, okay. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you very much.
James. Fine, thanks very much. Yeah.